You're listening to episode 179 of Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. In this broadcast, the faculty of Mid-America discuss theology and cultural issues from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing. Thank you for tuning in. In today's episode, Dr. Alan Strange continues to work through some of the later stages of early church history by examining two important councils that took place. But first of all, Dr. Strange, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Always good to be here. You have a book also that you would like to recommend to our listeners. What would that be? Well, last time when we were talking about Augustine, we I didn't mention, uh, for some of you who may be interested in following up, Peter Brown's biography of Augustine of Hippo. It's a very good book. So if you... I, I, I've not been giving biographies of everybody all the time. I've mentioned things here and there. But if you're going to read about a single person in the early church, you you should read his confessions, uh, and you might want to read Peter Brown's book on him. And he's also a fellow. I have a bunch of books here, but uh, I have something published by Erdman's. It's called Augustine Through the Ages. It's a, quite a big book. It's an encyclopedia. And it's in it's in alphabetical order, so you know you're a significant figure. You know you're a significant theologian if you get a big volume about you that's in alphabetical order. In other words, you have a reference work on your life. And there are other things like this about Augustine, but he is really the monumental figure. We've all these talks thus far have been in the ancient church, and some people would even put Augustine in the medieval church. I don't. I think Gregory the Great is the beginning of that. And we can talk about that at the proper time. But Augustine is um, so important. But these councils are important. The councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. Yeah, so... With Nicaea, that took place in 325. You you address that. They talked uh, that council addressed the person of Christ, and then in 381 with the Council of Constantinople. But what about the Third Ecumenical Council? What happened at Ephesus in 431 AD? Yeah, so things kind of you might say get picked up there. We've looked at the at the two councils from from the third century, the fourth century. And these ones in the 5th century are quite important. And you might say sort of cap off a significant part of the, especially the Christological controversies, the controversies having to do with Christ. So Cyril of Alexandria was a fellow who, well, he succeeded Theophilus. Uh, We may have mentioned him before. But Cyril is in the city of Alexandria. And I just recall for you that... uh, Alexandria sort of stands over against Antioch. In the city of Antioch, uh, they took a very kind of, you could say, literal, grammatical, historical approach uh, to Christology and to Scripture. And in Alexandria, they took a more spiritualized, allegorical approach. And I've also said before that our view would sort of lie between them two, a kind of typological view. In other words, if you take the approach of Alexandria too far, you end up with a Christ who is who is God and not properly man. And if you take the Antioch approach too far, a kind of grammatical, historical, literal approach, they're able to deal with his humanity, but not sufficiently with his deity. And so we're still dealing with that issue. Now, Cyril, again, as appropriate for somebody from Alexandria, so stressed the unity of the person of Christ, uh, what we would call the the hypostatic union of the the two natures, the uh, the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. He so stressed that over against Nestorius's emphasis on the two natures. Nestorius really wanted to emphasize sort of the 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 you could say the the separateness or the distinctness of the natures, and so. He also, Nestorius also, did not believe or did not support the use of the word theotokos to describe the Blessed Virgin Mary, as she was coming to be referred to. And theotokos means something like God-bearer. Later on, it will be in the Latin version, uh, Mater Dei, translated as Mother of God, but God-bearer, our mother of God, either are, are okay. Some of our Protestant listeners might think, well, we don't believe that about Mary, that she's the mother of God. Well, all that that meant at the time in the fifth century, all that Cyril meant by it and that Nestorius misunderstood was that uh, 
Mary is in fact, the one that she gives birth to is in fact God himself, God in the flesh, God of God, very God of very God, begotten, not made, you know, as we confess. And so Mary gave birth to one who was the second person of the blessed, holy, undivided Trinity, who was God from heaven himself. The Those who didn't like the word theotokos, some wanted to use the word Christotokos and uh, Christ bearer. But what they, some of them, I don't believe Nestorius was guilty of this. Uh, Nestorius ultimately doesn't prove to be perhaps a Nestorian. But um, there were those who used the favored term among the Nestorians, Christotokos, Christ bearer, to mean that what Mary had was a man who became God. It's the heresy called adoptionism. You see, we believe that Jesus was God who became a man. There's this heresy called adoptionism. Uh, It's part of dynamic monarchianism, Uh, a little something there for nothing. Dynamic monarchianism, which teaches that Jesus is in fact this great man who becomes God, probably at his baptism, because there you see uh, the Father saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, and the Spirit in the form of a dove is seen there. And so this is there's a whole theology based on that. Well, part of the reason then the church wanted to use the word theotokos was to make it clear that the one that Mary bore was in fact God. And he received his humanity, the orthodox doctrine, as he receives his divinity, of course, because he himself is divine. His, he's conceived by the seed of the Holy Spirit, not through, not through human agency. And he receives his humanity from his mother, Mary. So he receives the deity as part of a, the Godhead. He possesses that always, but he receives his humanity through his mother, Mary. And so that was part of what that was was looking at and affirming. So what happens is ultimately Nestorius, here's the bottom line, Nestorius can't properly account for the hypostatic union. In other words, Nestorius talks about the two natures, uh, that Jesus is God and man. I, as I said, I don't believe he was an adoptionist. But the hypostatic union talks about how these two natures come together in one person. We could say the two natures rightly understood in the hypostatic union bespeak the integrity, here's a big word, the integrity of the theanthropic person. The theanthropic person refers to Jesus as the God-man and the integrity of his person. So Nestorius has a problem in really relating these two things so that these two natures are in one person. So though he doesn't formally say that Jesus is two natures and two persons, it's concluded that from his approach in which he's unable to properly relate the two natures and just keeps them distinct that you end up functionally with two persons. And so it that always sounds strange to people when you're teaching it. If you just say two natures, two persons, and they say, well, Nestorius believed Jesus was two persons? That sounds ridiculous. Well, he didn't actually put it quite like that, but that is where this goes because he could not relate them. And so what happened at Ephesus is there is a condemnation of this approach as it was understood of Nestorius, and the formal title Theotokos is approved that Mary is in fact the God-bearer or the mother of God. Well, the intervening years between Ephesus and Chalcedon witnessed the imbalance that had existed in the church uh, in the tipping of the scales to Alexandria over Antioch and Christology. See, at Nicaea that you mentioned uh, earlier, Jared, just to remind our listeners, we could we could put it this way. At Nicaea, the unity of the Godhead was secured, yet not the distinctness of the persons. That was really secured at Constantinople. And you have something similar. At Ephesus, you have the hypostatic union that Jesus is one, one person. That's secured, but not the distinctness of the natures. That's what you get at Chalcedon. And so 
you have this problem that arises back in Alexandria, right? So Nestorius was very influenced by Antioch. So he tended to go in that direction. Now, you have this influence of Alexandria coming to the fore again, and you have a fellow named Eutyches. And Eutyches comes to teach that there were two natures before, but only one after the incarnation. So Eutyches says there's a kind of theoretical moment at which, you know, Christ, who is the second person of the Blessed Holy Undivided Trinity, his deity is present, and there's this humanity united to it that just in almost like a theoretical instance, there's a distinction, but the moment it's united, the the deity, he would say, of course, logically and rationally, is going to swallow up the humanity. So if if Nestorius had a problem showing the unity of the person of Christ, Eutyches has a problem with the distinctness of the natures. And Chalcedon in 451, 20 years after Ephesus, is really going to be the sought-for redress of these grievances. And I should say, Leo the Great was the bishop of Rome then, and um, he had been appealed to, Eutyches appealed to Leo a couple of years before this uh, council, and Leo condemned him. It was interesting, you know, Eutyches said to Leo, oh, well, aren't I orthodox? And Leo basically said, no, you're a heretic. And that becomes the basis of the formula for Chalcedon. I've urged a few things that you read from the ancient church The Confessions last time, I've talked about Athanasius on the Incarnation or Basil on the Holy Spirit. This isn't a really long document, but I would urge all of you to Google and read. It's a short document, the Tome, what's called the Tome of Leo. And there really is nothing quite like it. It certainly has a lot of the same kind of language that Augustine does. Listen to this language where he's relating the two natures in one person, where he's bringing it together and what Chalcedon will confess. Leo says, so the proper character of both natures was maintained and came together in a single person. Lowliness was taken up by majesty, weakness by strength, mortality by eternity. To pay off the debt of our state, invulnerable nature was united to a nature that could suffer, so that in a way that corresponded to the remedies we needed, one and the same mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, could both on the one hand die and on the other be incapable of death. Thus was true God born in the undiminished and perfect nature of a true man, complete in what is his and complete in what is ours. And in another place in this, I'd love to read more of it, but he says, So without leaving his Father's glory behind, the Son of God comes down from his heavenly throne and enters the depth of our world. Just that statement, because we tend to think, because Wesley was a little off on his Christology. He left that throne above, but there's a sense in which he never left the throne. That makes it all the more amazing that he remains fully who he is as God, and he becomes fully who we are as man. Now, I hope all of our listeners are stopping and thinking and pausing. You're praising God, but you're saying, my goodness, He remained fully God in every sense of the word, and he became man. What did his humility consist of in becoming man? Not in emptying himself of being God in any way. The emptying was that he became man. He who gave the law came under the law. He came under the power of the law. He submitted to the law, and he submitted to the death of even the cross, So this is the humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ, not that he somehow put off being God. He didn't. And it's put this way uh, in the formulary uh, that the church adopted in condemning Eutyches and confessing in its key statement that Christ existed, it put it this way, Christ existed in two natures which undergo no confusion, no change. That's against Eutyches. No division, no separation. That's against Nestorius. At no point was the difference between the natures taken away through the union, but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and a single subsistent being. He is not parted or divided into two persons, but is one and the same only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Thanks be to God. Next time, Dr. Strange wraps up this segment of the early church with some comments on the regular and secular clergy, monasticism, and the papacy. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchbor. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.